God said, Make an ark out of real gopher wood, and line it with tar, as shipbuilders should. Three stories, one window, one door you must make, and two of each animal, then shall you take. Into the ark with your family of eight, your wife and three sons, each one with his mate. Said Noah, An ark? But where will it float? And why should I build such an oversized boat? It never has rained since the day of my birth. Not one drop of water has fallen on the earth. God said, When I look at this earth I have made, I see nothing but evil and sin on parade. I am sorry I ever put man on this land, for they disobey even my slightest command. Thus over the earth a great flood will I send, the heavens shall open, and waters descend, to punish all those whom my laws have ignored. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah got busy, the trees he cut down, the lumber he gathered, in piles on the ground, all sizes, all lengths, an unusual collection, all measured to fit God's specific direction. This is Buzz sang the Zaw. Saw Kerwin called the hammer. The noise was terrific, an ear splitting clamor. Oh, Noah's gone crazy, the people all said. He's preached for so long it's affected his head. They gathered around him, they laughed and they jeered. They taunted, they scolded, they snickered and sneered. But Noah kept working, he heard not a word. He knew when he started they'd think it absurd to build a huge ark right upon the dry land. He never expected that they'd understand. Hey, Noah, quit working. Look up in the sky. The sun is still shining. Now please tell us why. You have worked for 120 long years. You can't float a boat on a bucket of tears. Oh, Noah was sad as he bowed his gray head and put down his tools as he quietly said, Why don't you worship our God anymore? You curse and you gamble. You're always at war. You do not believe what God says he will do, or else he'd be helping. Yes, each one of you. For over this earth a great flood will he send, the heavens shall open, and waters descend, and that is the reason I am building this boat, for those will be saved who inside it will float. The spectators stood, not a one volunteered. The sun was still shining, no rain clouds appeared. Noah spoke gently, it's time to leave now, this flood God has promised is not make-believe. He stood at the, do at the door as the animals came, two at a time, some wild and some tame, the lions and tigers, the panda bears too, porcupine and weasels, two cows with one moo. So up the big gangplank and into the ark, Noah and family prepared to embark, and the Lord God himself did shut the big door. Oh no, you are wrong, not yet did it pour, seven long days they were shut in the boat, not one drop of water to get them afloat. But all of a sudden, from out of the blue, came a little black green cloud that expanded and grew. It thundered and blustered all over the sky, as flashes of lightning went sizzling by. It rained and it poured forty nights, forty days, but inside the ark they were singing God's praise. Higher and higher the floodwaters rose, reaching the top of the biggest plateaus. The angry flow gushed from its deep-seated fountains, twenty feet over the loftiest mountains. Till no one was left, not a thing anywhere, just the ark calm and rocking, no worry or care. For five months they floated, till God caused a wind to blow over the earth he had just disciplined. For five months the waters were slowly subsiding, while lower and lower the ark was still riding. But all of a sudden, the big boat hit land on top of Mount Ararat, just as God planned. The waters went down, the mountains peeked through. To find out what next this man Noah would do, he opened the window and let out a raven that flew back and forth in search of a haven till all of the waters had dried off the land. So then Noah took a small dove in his hand and sent her to find how the water had drained. She shortly came back for the flood tide remained. Seven days later, the trip was repeated and this time her mission was fully completed. A fresh olive leaf in her beak she had tucked and at twilight returned to show what she had plucked. Seven more days again Noah waited, and this time the dove never once hesitated, but took off forever, returning no more, so now Noah knew they could all go ashore. Noah went out with his sons and his wife to begin on the earth a completely new life. The minute he landed, not once did he falter, but quickly got busy and built a new altar to offer a sacrifice unto the one who had kept them secure since the flood had begun. God was well pleased and said, Noah, take note. Never again will you need such a boat. For look up, I give you my own guarantee. Noah looked up, and what did he see? 
purple and yellow and crimson and blue, all of the colors right there in plain view. There was a rainbow, God's promise to man, that never again would he flood the whole land. God is still faithful. God is still true. Whatever he says, he always will do. Welcome to our living room. It's good to have you join us virtually, and it's good to have a very attentive audience here with me today physically. Um, oh my, it does look like maybe uh, they saw the subject and just jumped straight to application. So uh, if you're ready for application, you can go straight to that too. Uh, it's been a blessing to have my whole family help me put this on. They worked really hard. Thank them if you get a chance. Um, it was really neat to turn different parts of it over to different ones and they just uh, went at it with their creativity and did a great job. And something you might not think about is the video production. So thank Jensen and Tyler for that. And we know we aren't the greatest show. Uh, uh, and that wasn't our goal. But we did want to bless you and brighten your day and honor God. Recently I got sick and I went to the doctor and he told me that I needed to rest for most of the week. And it was interesting timing to be told to rest while I'm preparing a sermon for rest. I think God was was uh, preparing me for something there. And it is interesting homework, by the way, so I would recommend it. Try out the homework, not the reason for the homework, though. So, if your Bible's handy, you could turn to Matthew 11, and I'd like to read three verses there about rest. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. God, as we look into these very familiar verses, pray that we will hear you whisper to each of us and to our heart, come, and that we will come, come to you and find rest. In Jesus' name, amen. So the very first word here in these verses is come. And it says that those who are weary and burdened are invited to come to Jesus. The uh, Laga Sense lexicon set, gives this for, for being weary, to exhaust or get tired through overuse or great strain or stress. And I'm often weary and burdened. And if this is something you can identify, you'll be like, identify with, you'll be like me and, and realize this verse is for you. When I got sick re recently, I didn't want to eat, didn't want to drink, or really any of the things that are normally fun and enjoyable to do. There was one thing I wanted to do, and that was close my eyes and rest all day, all night. That's really all I wanted to do. That gives you a little idea of a heart that is weary and burdened. And if your heart is weary and burdened, Jesus has an invitation for you. It's to come, and it's a personal invitation. It's not just to follow Jesus from a distance. It's to come to him, close into his presence. Bring our weariness and our burdens there and, and come to him and and what will we find when we come to him? We see that next he says, I will give you rest. Rest there, again from the Logos Sense Lexicon, to cause to rest, to cause someone to take a break from their activities in order to be refreshed. That's what Jesus does. He causes us to stop what we're doing, all of our frantic going here, going there, doing this, doing that, and rest. And it's so completely different than the religious leaders that Jesus referred to in Matthew 23, 4. And they were making people carry heavy burdens. And a lot of religious leaders are still making people carry heavy burdens. Jesus offers rest. I think we see in Scripture that rest is something God has built into the rhythms of life. We can make it with too little rest for a while, but eventually it will catch up with us. And our lack of rest will be like a very determined creditor that will force us to sell everything we own to pay back our debt of rest. In the Old Testament, there were times that, well, in the Old Testament, God had very specific rules about rest. And when Israel refused to rest, 
There were times God actively intervened, and it was rather unpleasant. And I don't see this Old Testament pattern of regulated rest in the New Testament, but I do see a principle of rest in the New Testament. And one thing that I've been thinking about, have been since early on with this coronavirus pandemic, is that as God redeems this, I wonder, could one purpose be to slow us down so we'll catch up on rest? And especially maybe finding rest in Jesus. Moving on to the next verse, verse 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. A yoke here can be a metaphor for service or obligation rather than being yoked together like two animals. And so what Jesus could be doing here is is uh, calling us to place our lives into serving and obeying him. But it's but this yoke is more likely referring to a human yoke than an animal yoke. And a human yoke across the shoulders was actually used to make a burden easier to carry. So the word picture of the yoke is probably to show us that coming to Jesus will actually lighten our load. He says, learn from me. There in his presence, we don't just learn about Jesus, like we tend to do sometimes in good books, or even from the Bible. Sometimes we just learn about him, but he says, learn from me. And one of the things that mentions about, that he says about himself, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't talk much about himself at all in scripture. But one thing he says about himself is he's gentle and humble and as you come close into his presence, you may be expecting rebuke, discipline, but here he says, when you're weary and burdened and you come close into his presence, he will, you will find rest and you will learn about him and learn that he is gentle and humble. So yeah, moving on, the next phrase is, you will find rest for your souls. And I just want to observe again that some people find the Christian life to be a heavy burden, but the first two verses that I read today equate coming to Jesus with rest, and the last verse equates it with a light burden. So while he does want us to serve him, the service is easy compared to serving Satan. And while he does um, place a burden on us, it's light compared to Satan's burdens. So if you've come to Jesus and you've not received a lighter burden than what you had, you need to ask, have you really come to Jesus? <clears throat> As John 15 mentions, when we, when we come to Jesus and live there, we're like a branch connected to a grapevine. And the life of the branch, life of the vine flows into the branch, into us, and gives us life, and then we bear fruit. And so resting in Jesus, paradoxically to us, as we want to rush around and do stuff, resting in Jesus is actually the way to become fruitful. <clears throat> Rest is like fuel. And it energizes us to live a full life, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And it reminds me of my dirt bike when I want to fill it up with fuel. I don't just go out to our sturdy built storage barn and look for the uh, any gas I can find and dump it in. I make sure that I got gas at Fairview. It is ethanol free. And I, um, I make sure that I add fuel stabilizer and I use high quality synthetic two-stroke oil mix. And with this fuel, my dirt bike operates at peak performance. It roars. And, and that's what rest for Jesus does for us. It fuels our soul and we operate at peak performance. I do want to note though, that this rest isn't always simple or immediate. And so don't be discouraged if you find that you've been coming to Jesus, but you're not finding rest. Jesus didn't always either immediately. When he was on the cross, he apparently quoted from Psalm 22, and these are this is a psalm that David wrote. I don't know what David was thinking or experiencing when he wrote it, but Jesus did appear, appear to quote from it, and this song has, psalm has striking parallels to, to Jesus and his crucifixion. It talks about piercing Jesus, piercing my hands and feet, and um, it, it talks about... Um, casting lots for the, the clothing and so on. Uh, but in the early verses, it says this, and this is where Jesus quoted, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my quiet cries of anguish? And just going on here, this is a little further, some of this is a little further than what Jesus quoted, but it appears to be right after what, what he quoted. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Jesus, I'm sure, experienced the same thing in the Garden of Gethsemane, experienced it on the cross. It appears that this was a time when he was finding no rest. But look at the next verse. David wrote, Yet you are enthroned as a holy one. You are the one Israel praises. And so whatever Jesus had in mind, we're not sure, we're not even sure what David had in mind, but, it, but, it, but David, as he wrote it, right after talking about finding no rest, he went on, to praise God and trust God and that's the approach we need to have when we come to Jesus seeking rest and we find none we need to keep praising him keep our focus on him and there will come a time when we will find rest for our souls I'd like to wrap this up with a couple of thoughts about COVID-19 and just how we apply these thoughts about rest don't respond to COVID-19 or any other life challenges by increasing the frantic pace of your life to ensure you'll have enough of everything or to ensure you avoid all pain or whatever, whatever. Make this a season of resting in Jesus. Get a lot of sleep. Slow down. Just be. Turn off your phone and social media and the negative news and soak in the good news of the gospel. Treasure the few people you get to interact with. Resting doesn't always mean sitting on the couch all day long, but doing those things you enjoy that bring rest to your soul. There aren't rules here, just a principle, rest. And as you find things to do that bring rest to you, look for Jesus in those moments. Turn your heart to him. Give him your fears, give him your worries. Turn everything over to him. Learn from him. See his beautiful heart. Come to Jesus and find rest. I do want to note here yet, briefly, this sermon is not for everyone. This sermon is specifically for Christians. And if you're not a Christian and would like to become one and learn what it is to rest in Jesus, today you are invited to do that. And if you know someone who's a Christian, talk to them about it. Talk to a pastor or someone that you trust and they can help you. Um, to become a Christian. Read in scripture. That's where you find the answer. And if you want to contact me, I welcome you to do that. You could email me at wordoflifesouthhutch.com and I'll get in contact with you. Let's pray. God, whatever um, these dear people are facing that are listening today, whether they're, they're people that I know or, or come to Word of Life or whether it's someone that I don't know, it doesn't matter. Whatever they're facing, I pray that you will draw them close to you, close to your heart, and that they will experience your rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Our girls will be helping me with announcement time today. Our prayer focus for today is BMA's call to a day of fasting and prayer, and that is today. If you'd like more details on that, you can check out the email bulletin. If you are a man and you would be interested in accountability groups, you can talk to Marlon about that. Mary suggests that we read from 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 to 21. There is going to be a grocery shower for Nathan and Clarissa, hopefully next Sunday. There will be more details coming on that later. Our birthdays this week, Elaine, Lynn, my mom, Janice, Ardell, Wes Miller, and Tyler. Happy birthday to all of you. Okay, today's offering will be for Pilgrim School, and there are more directions for how to give in your bulletins. And last but not least, a pro tip coming up from Pastor Laverne. It's been a long time since I was as sick as I was last week, and a couple of the uh, things that were really miserable were just being really cold and really weak, and so I spent a lot of time on either the couch in the living room or the bed, um, yeah, in the bedroom, of course, duh, and um, one night, about 10 o'clock at night, I decided to get up from the couch and go to bed, 
and uh, for most of you that's no big deal but for me being that sick that was a really big ordeal I was uh, I'm, I was barely up until I was just frozen and of course I was just terribly weak I was carrying my drink with me and this drink was a mixture of ginger ale to settle my stomach and cranberry juice to fight infection and I'm not recommending this for you but uh, it worked for me and so I was carrying this drink with me and walked into our dark bedroom there and, and uh, so in a hurry I'm cold I'm weak I want to quickly get in bed and warm up and I set my drink down there and it collides with the coaster and I was it was this horrifying feeling I just spilled this tall glass of juice down over the bed down over the nightstand and onto the carpet and after being horrified for a few moments I uh, just climbed into bed and Annette of course being the saint that she is she got up without any complaint and cleaned it up but even had she not I would have done the same thing I would have gotten in bed and closed my eyes and rested I had nothing left I was too tired I was too weak um, I just wasn't able to clean up my own mess I needed to go rest and I think sometimes resting in Jesus looks a lot like that there are times when our pain is just too great we can't find healing or um, our mess is just too big we can't clean it up and all we can do is climb into bed and rest and trust it all to Jesus and that's exactly what he wants us to do turn it all over to him and let him clean it up because only he can that's what resting in Jesus is and that is what brings fuel for our souls and like I told you I don't use just any fuel for my dirt bike I use premium fuel and I put the right things into it so that my dirt bike roars and your soul doesn't need just any kind of rest it needs the rest Jesus offers and then only can it roar and this week I'd like to give you an assignment my doctor gave me an assignment to take most of the week to rest and I want to give you an assignment this week your job is to rest remember first you rest then you roar.